Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us and uh, being patient as we work through some of our technical difficulties. Um, we're still not on Facebook Live, but again, like I said before, if you guys have questions and want to participate with us, please feel free to jump over here on Zoom and um, we can interact that way. But today um, on our Educated Horsemen series, we're going to talk with Dr. Aaron Oberhoff about doing your own equine fecals and some updating deworm, updated deworming protocols. Um, and she's in the lab, so she's gonna, and has access to her lab, so she's gonna walk us through these steps. And um, hopefully, if you guys have any questions along the way, I'll be able to field those for her. So, Dr. Overall, please. It just said recording has stopped. Did you I hear that? on Facebook, yeah. Is that okay. Little, okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm here in the lab with some uh, fecal samples to, to take you through how to do at-home fecal uh, egg counts on your horses. And the goal, we've kind of changed our tune over the last several years regarding, um, we've kind of gotten away from just routine deworming and moved more towards uh, identifying a need for deworming and targeting specific parasite loads. Um, and we've moved more towards a targeting, a targeted deworming protocol as opposed to more of a blanket uh, prophylactic deworming, deworming protocol. And the goal of any kind of deworming protocol on your horse is not to eliminate. Um, you're never going to be able to eliminate the parasite load. Um, it's actually quite healthy for a horse to have some parasite load. The question becomes how much is too much. Um, and so there's where it's important for us to identify who our low, moderate, and high shedders are so that you can individualize um, a deworming protocol for that particular horse. And that's, a, that's the important thing to consider um, is that each horse has its own individual susceptibility to parasites. And so how you manage your gelding may not be how you can manage uh, your mare um, in terms of, of their own individual immune systems and how they handle parasite loads. <coughs> so doing fecals at home is really simple. Um, you can buy everything that you need usually online. I looked this morning. Uh, you do, you will need a microscope, but you don't need a very high powered one and usually a kid's um, beginner set. I found one on Amazon today for $40. Um, that's usually just enough power that you need to visualize the parasite eggs on uh, under microscopy. So you don't need anything fancy. Um, what you'll need, I don't know if I can kind of zoom you in here. You will need some sort of fecal solution. The goal of a fecal solution is basically to create a solution that is more dense than the parasite egg. So you need a specific gravity that is greater than the parasite egg so that they rise to the top and then can stick to a cover slip and be visualized under a microscope. There are a lot of different um, fecal solutions that are available both commercially and you can actually make some at home on your own if, if you're so inclined. I have here a, um, a sodium nitrate solution and I just, all of this is available um, online. You don't have to have any kind of special credentials to purchase um, any of these materials. If you wanna make some um, at home, you can use a sugar solution, a, a magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt solution. And if you're interested in any of those recipes, I can, I can provide some resources to Dr. Walker. But I basically put some fecal solution in a little squirt bottle. Um, you will need your fecal sample, obviously. Um, ideally, the fecal sample will be fresh, but if you can't, if you need to obtain it like the night before or several hours before, definitely be sure to store it in the refrigerator. Um, might be wise to also clearly mark it as horse poop, unless you're a prankster, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but if you leave them at room temperature, then the eggs will have, will have hatched and you will no longer be able to visualize them under the microscope. So, Fresh is best, but if you can't, keep it in the fridge. You will need some sort of um, container to make, to mix your um, sample with. There's a couple of different techniques that are out there. Um, I think most common anymore is the use of the McMaster slide, um, which has the benefit of a grid system that allows you to, to better visualize and count your, um, your eggs. I'm a creature of habit and I tend to, to do things the old fashioned way like I was taught. So today I'm going to show you my way. Um, there's some other great YouTube videos on using the McMaster technique, which the procedure is pretty much the same, just a couple of different steps. So you'll need um, a container to strain your solution into. 
some sort of funnel. Um, if you don't have a funnel, you can also use like a tea strainer. I thought I, oh, I know. So you can purchase a tea strainer if, uh, if that's a better option for you. And you'll need a microscope. You get a little closer here. A microscope and then something to weigh your sample out in. Um, you're going to be calculating eggs per gram. So it's important to know how many grams of feces you're actually using for your fecal egg count. So I'm going to can this. Let me know if I need to adjust. It's kind of hard to do. So I'm going to put my cup on. I'm going to account for the weight of the cup. I guess I'll be a good laboratory technician and wear gloves, even though I'm not scared of a little horse poop. So I have my scale at zero, and I typically add about two grams. You can add anywhere from maybe two to four grams. If you're using the McMaster technique, it requests or uh, requires you to add four grams of feces to 26 mils of fecal solution. Ah, look at that, perfectly at two. 2.09, but we'll call that 2. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to, I can move. These tubes are about 15 mils. You're really only kind of limited by the volume of the tube. Otherwise, when you go to strain it, and if you have a lot of excess, you're going to overflow the tube. So I'm going to dump that in here, and I'm going to create a nice poo slurry. That's my scientific term. It's trademarked. Nice poo slurry here, so it's nice and mixed and homogenized. <clears throat> and then you want to I have a, a little funnel here that is um, attached to my tube with a little bit of cheesecloth. Again, if you don't want to use the cheesecloth in the funnel, you can use a tea strainer. Um, whatever, whatever is um, adequate for filtering out all of the fecal debris while keeping the fluid behind. So now I've kind of, I'm going to use my tongue depressor here to kind of filter all of this down and squeeze it down into the tube. And sometimes this is easier just by hand. So we'll let all that go down into the tube. I'm just going to use my gloved finger to kind of squeeze all the excess liquid out. I'm sorry if I'm blocking. And discard that. And then you've got what's left over there. And then I'm going to, can you see this? I'm going to top this off. I'm going to go slowly so that I don't create a bunch of air bubbles. I'm going to kind of squirt it down the side of the tube. And I want to fill it up until there is um, a positive meniscus or a positive kind of dome over to where it's almost overflowing, but not overflowing. And then I'm going to take a cover slip and set it on top and I'm going to let it sit there for about 10 minutes maybe 8 to 10 minutes if you're working with a salt solution um, the longer you let it sit the more it um, crystallizes and it can begin to interfere with um, your visual field making it difficult to observe the parasite egg so you don't want to let it sit too long um, I kind of I left one sit this morning just to show you all that all those crusties along the side that's um, also occurring under the cover slip and it's going to make it very difficult to, to visualize. <clears throat> if you were um, using the McMaster technique, you would take a transfer pipette and you would, instead of putting this into a, a tube with a cover slip on the top of it, you would probably just pour it into a, a clean container, um, mix it thoroughly and sample from the middle of the sample and fill each of these chambers um, with 
Let's see, I can, when I take this cover slip off, I can demonstrate that. But you're going to fill each of these chambers um, with your solution. Let it sit for about 10 minutes. And the, the goal of letting it sit is now you're letting all of those eggs rise to the surface and then can be um, visualized. In, in this case, they're going to stick to the cover slip uh, and you're going to put that on a microscope slide and then visualize it under the microscope. Um, in case of the McMaster slide, you're going to let those eggs rise to the surface and make them more visible. So while that's sitting, um, unfortunately, I don't have the, the technology here to let you see under the microscope what I'm looking at, but I do have some pictures. Play. There it is. Can you see it okay? Is it there? <clears throat> Looks okay, great. so if this if you're doing a fecal on um, a healthy adult horse then what you're going to be looking for are strongyle eggs. Um, adult horses typically do not have uh, problems with periascris or roundworms. Where we see roundworms is in um, horses that are younger than two to three years of age. They can also be found in horses that are older horses that are ill or um, immunocompromised. But if, if this is an adult healthy horse, then what we're going to be counting is mainly strongyle eggs. Hey, Erin. <clears throat> Um, yes, do you want to know what magnification these photos are? Um, that's a good question. These, the one on the left is a 10x, and the one on the right is a 40x, I'm assuming. There's some, some great pictures. I took these off of the internet. There were some better pictures than I could have created. Um, when you start looking at your, at your and I'll, when we're done with this incubation, I'll, I'll kind of take you through at least how to set the microscope. When you start looking at your sample, you want to focus everything um, using the 10x objective um, and kind of get yourself acquainted, get into the right um, visual plane. And then once you have, once you start counting, you want to switch to 40x objective and um, scan the entire um, visual field of the cover slip. So, <clears throat> this is a nice picture here on the right. Let me, let me go back. Let me talk about the, the left picture. Um, I teach a lab in horse production at LSU, and the, um, so students always get confused about what's air bubbles and what are parasite eggs. So if you've done it with the, if you've done it my way with the cover slip, um, you are inevitably, inevitably going to have some air bubbles. Um, you can try to prevent against it. I'll show you here in a second when we put it on the slide by doing it slowly and at an angle, but you're going to have air bubbles. And so they can be varying sizes. Um, depending on how much air has been trapped under the cover slip, they can be quite large or um, much smaller. I don't know. Is my cursor visible? Yes. Okay. So air bubbles, these, these are classic examples of air bubbles and you will see them um, usually throughout your, your cover slip. Um, and this is, this is a comparison of an air bubble next to a strongyle egg. So don't be um, concerned by the air bubbles. Um, just don't mistake them for any kind of a parasite. Here's a, a roundworm, a pair of I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump in really fast. Yeah, and, sure. Um, the way you guys can tell the difference if it's not completely obvious to you, usually air bubbles are fairly circular. Um, and they'll have a little bit of refractiveness to them, so it'll almost look like it's reflecting light. Whereas your parasite eggs, you can see clearly has like a cell wall around it. Um, and you can see sometimes once you get to that 40 uh, magnification, um, you'll be able to see contents within the cell. Whereas with the air bubble, you're not going to really see anything inside of the air bubble. Right. So on this right picture, we have uh, roundworm eggs uh, or periascris as well compared to a strongyle egg. They're going to be appear um, round, circular, uh, with kind of an inner circle. Sometimes um, you can get some fecal debris, some fecal artifacts that may look like roundworms, but you can clearly see um, the borders, the, the wall of the ovum, and then the, the inner um, contents. Um, and it, I don't have a picture to compare that to with just some, some artifacts, but um, you can clearly tell the difference if you really stop and look at the two. 
Let's see, this is a, just another picture of a Strongyl type egg. There's no way under microscopy to distinguish between the different species of Strongyl. Um, very rarely anymore do we see large Strongyls. We've pretty much taken care of them. Uh, the, the concern now are small Strongyls. And so that's going to make up the majority of what you see on your fecal, um, on your fecal float. Uh, there is a way to actually determine what species, but you'd have to actually sample that inner contents and subject it to a different analysis, which is something that you can't do with this type of microscopy. So we kind of just lump them all into strong giles and, and count them. So all of these, um, a classic strong gile egg is going to appear oval in shape, and you can see the, the cell contents and the morula there that are, are not, uh, nicely nestled there in the center. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that you might happen on by chance, uh, they're actually, they usually don't show up on fecal floats, um, but sometimes they do, are um, anaplocephala or tapeworms. Tapeworms are another concern in horses. Um, they can appear, let's see, I don't know. Over here, my, uh, hang on a second. My picture is over the picture I want to show you. So this is a, a tapeworm egg. Oh, excuse me. A tapeworm egg next to um, several strongyl eggs. They can appear somewhat um, triangular um, to a little more rounded, depending on the species. But um, usually, we're not looking for them in a fecal float. Um, if we happen upon one, it's usually by chance. But the best way to diagnose tapeworms is to see tapeworm segments in the feces. Um, there are some, some serological testing, um, some blood sampling that you can do that actually look for antibodies against tapeworms. But um, a fecal egg count is not a reliable method for determining tapeworm um, counts in your horse. Some other artifacts that might show up that um, you might question. Uh, in grazing animals, it's not uncommon to see pollen. Um, to me, pollen always looks like a Mickey Mouse head. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be this dark, um, but this is a, a classic pollen grain, um, and you may come across those in your sample as well. Um, you may see plant material, plant fibers that made it through um, the uh, straining process. Uh, but the, you will see other things in your fecal flow that are not to be that, that are not to be concerned about. So, a fecal egg count at any point in time will just give you a snapshot of what kind of shedder your horse is at that point. Um, so, if they have, I think Dr. Walker has a, a nice infographic that she's going to share that um, we get all of our guidelines from the American Association of Equine Practitioners. And a horse that sheds less than 200 eggs per gram is considered a low, 200 to 500 is a moderate, and then greater than 500 is um, a, a high shedder. So you can use a single point fecal egg count to determine what kind of shedder your horse is. Um, if you want to determine how well your particular deworming protocol is working, then you want to look at a fecal, fecal egg count reduction test. And basically this requires two fecal egg counts. You're gonna take one uh, before you deworm, and then you're going to take another fecal 14 days after the dewormer in question. And then you're gonna take that as a percentage of the pretreatment count. So you're gonna take eggs per gram before you deworm, uh, subtract out the eggs per gram after 14 days of deworming, divide all of that by the eggs per gram from the pretreatment, and then multiply by 100 to calculate your percent reduction. And I thought this was a, a nice graph that, or a table, I'm sorry, that I um, got from the AAEP guidelines. There's not, they're, they're still working on determining cutoff values for resistance um, as we continue to study um, implementing resistance in horses, but there are some suggested ranges for at least the three categories or the three dewormers that we use. Um, Fimbendazole or oxybendazole, pyrantal, and then an ivermectin or amoxidectin. Um, there's, there's, I don't see one here for praziquanil, but, um, and this is based on the fecal egg count reduction test. And if so, you can follow this table here that 
Um, if there's no resistance, then there should be um, a 99% reduction um, in finbenazole or oxybenazole treated animals and then so on and so forth as you follow the table. But um, so if you want to determine how well your particular deworming protocol is working in your particular horse, then a fecal egg count reduction test um, is, is an important piece of information. Oh, that's all I had. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Dr. Walker, did you have anything else to add? Let me unmute myself really fast. Yeah. So I think it's important to kind of cover this and you did it um, casually, but not specifically. So I'm going to go ahead and say this. You know, a lot of people still believe that we need to be deworming every other month because that's what we were taught. That's what our grandparents did. That's what our parents did. If we were so lucky to have people in our family, um, to have horses before us and teach us how to manage um, worms or in deworming protocols. Um, the problem with that is, is there's only six classes of anhelminthics available for use in horses and they're not making any more. There have been quite a bit of development in some homeopathic or more natural types of dewormers. However, none of them are supported by scientific evidence and none of them are approved for use in horses to actually show a reduction of parasite load. Um, so it's really important that we utilize the drugs that we have available to manage our population of parasites um, effectively. And that's why we do fecal egg, egg counts now. Um, it's important when we're talking about finding out how we, we use our fecal egg counts to figure out how we're going to manage these horses. And honestly, if you were to look at your horse, um, most of us who are taking care of our horses and doing all the management techniques on a regular basis are not going to start seeing the issues that a high parasite load would, would display. So most of us don't have horses that are in poor body condition with rough hair coats and the scraggly wormy belly. Um, and that's a, a question I was just about to get to, Julia. Um, even if you do find a high shedder, even if you do have a high shedder, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to affect that individual horse negatively. Um, there's really no magic number that says this is way too many worms. We've got to hit this horse really hard. Um, every animal is individual and they're going to manage the amount of parasite load that they have the way they can, the best way they can. So, you know, you may have one gelding on your property, like Dr. Oberhaus was saying, that has, is a high shedder that looks healthy, has got a really shiny hair coat, never is off feed, never has any colic issues, nothing ever happens to them. And then you might have a moderate shedder that has some other underlying issues that the parasite load is really hard for that horse to manage. Um, so really what you're trying to do is find out what that individual animal has, and then we're going to recommend a deworming protocol based off of that, off of a blanket statement, okay? Um, so we're gonna manage our low, moderate, and high shedders differently, and we're gonna try and group them appropriately if it's available. So um, for example, there are some parasites that um, only young horses are susceptible to and, and maybe lactating mares. So we're gonna group them separate from our senior horses. Um, and especially if we have different pastures, we're going to rotate our animals through those pastures a little bit differently um, than we would just throwing everybody out in one large pasture together. Now, that being said, this seems like a lot of work, but um, doing these fecal egg counts really can kind of give you an idea. Um, for example, I have two, my two mares are low shedders. So I went from deworming six times a year to maybe once, twice a year, depending upon um, the situation. The pasture that we're in has a high bot infestation, so I end up doing twice a year just because I want to take care a little bit of those bots because bots are linked to, um, especially down here in the south, can cause more colic and um, impaction issues if they're not monitored carefully. Um, so there really is no, there's no magic number on what's an unhealthy amount of uh, parasite load in each horse. However, we do like to know if they are high shedders, because if they are high shedders, we're gonna, we're gonna deworm them at least three times a year, okay? And then those high shedders, once you start deworming them three times a year, it's important to think about this as a, a long-term management technique and not just, okay, we found out as a high shedder, we're gonna keep managing it this, it's, this way its whole life. Um, 
you're going to come back the next year and test that horse again. And through all of your management techniques and all your deworming, what you're going to be able to do is determine if that your deworming protocol has been effective. And then he may now, that horse may now be a moderate shedder or a low shedder, and you can bump him back down to that twice a year or once a year. Um, um, should you only treat for parasites if they show symptoms? I wouldn't say if they show symptoms, right? Because like I said, every horse is going to be a little bit different. You may have a horse that has a low load and is really kind of not doing well because it's got other underlying issues. You know, I've seen a lot of young horses that have, um, that need a little bit more support because they're just building up their antibodies and their resistance to the parasites that they're carrying. So I kind of feel like young horses need a little bit more support when it comes to deworming. And then your aged horses are also going to need a little bit more support depending upon where they are in that, that, that cycle of life. Um, and you know, some pastures are just different. You know, um, I've been fortunate um, in some overgrazed pastures and things that don't get rotated, animals don't get rotated off them frequently, they're going to have a higher parasite load. Um, and that means if they're grazing and they've got parasites in the pasture, they are consuming them, right? So they are reinfecting themselves with consumed parasites. Um, so some, some pastures are gonna tend to affect more horses than others will. And it really just determine, it really just depends on your stocking rate and what you have in your pasture and what kind of shedders you have in your pasture and how you're managing each of those animals. Um, Can I add something, Dr. Walker? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, and don't don't underestimate the value of just your own management skills. So if you have an opportunity to cross graze with ruminants, um, that can provide um, some parasite relief as well. It's not just dewormers that are, um, you know, everybody. That's the, the easiest one to go to usually is is to grab a dewormer and deworm your horse. But there are other non deworming strategies that you can. Um, you, used to manage parasite loads in your horses, um, not letting them graze um, stagnant water that's you know, near ponds, um, feeding them off the ground, cross grazing with ruminants, um, harrowing your pastures, things like that. So don't under underestimate the value of, of just individual management um, that can help, uh, help manage some of that parasite load as well. I'm and the one thing know. my, what? no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, my, uh, one thing that <laughs> we have a, a large group of, of research mares and geldings um, at the LSU Ag Center, and we know that we oftentimes have issues with tapeworms, and we know that they're not always going to show up on a fecal egg count. So oftentimes in the spring, we will target them with um, a dewormer uh, that has praziquanil in it that will target tapeworms um, in an effort to, to manage that in those horses. Um, tapeworms, especially, there's, there's, I'm not sure how, how true it is um, in terms of the, the science, but there has been an association between um, a, a large tapeworm load and impaction colics and interception colics. Um, tapeworms love to live in the ileocecal junction, and so that can be a site, especially if there's um, a large tapeworm burden there, um, that, can, that can usually lead to um, an interception or impaction colic. So um, sometimes, so I guess in, in regards to the question of if they're not symptomatic, should you not deworm them? Eh, I still think that once a year deworming is, is it is a recommendation, I think, of the, the AEP to even if you have a low shedder that is asymptomatic, um, maybe go ahead and deworm them in the spring. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Dr. I agree. Walker. I agree. Um, I've gotten to the point where I deworm my horses about once a year. Um, just because we can manage them. We have, um, we have 10 acres. We're fortunate that it's cross divided and we have a minimum of five pastures I can rotate horses through on a regular basis. So I really don't have to worry about uh, contaminating those pastures. And we have goats that go through and graze um, while horses aren't on it. So it takes care of some of those tall grasses. And we also go through and mow um, on a regular basis to kind of keep those um, tall weedy forages to a minimum. Now I will, I was just about to get there. Um, so I've gotten quite a bit of questions about um, daily dewormers and some of the holistic dewormers like um, specifically I've had a lot of question about using diatomaceous earth, the food grade, as um, a dewormer and while that may 
there may be some research that's shown anecdotal evidence that it may be effective in um, goats and chickens. I do not at this time think it's a wise decision to try to use that for horses. Um, there has not been any scientific evidence leading us to believe that diatomaceous earth is going to cure or um, help manage the parasite load in our horses. And unknowingly, you may create additional issues by trying to feed your horse um, based on dirt. Um, daily dewormers is part of one of the major issues of why we have such a high resistance right now. Um, let's just walk through how that would work. Okay, so we're giving, our horse has whatever load of parasites. We give it a small dose of dewormer. On that day, it's going to kill one, let's just play with numbers. Let's say it kills 1% of the total burden of parasites that your horse has. You have now exposed your horse and the, and the parasites living in its intestines to that specific dewormer. And every time it doesn't kill the 99, the other 99% of the parasite load, it's increasing their tolerance to that specific dewormer type. Now, daily dewormers um, have their place. Um, there are some uh, companies that will insure your horse for colic if you use their daily dewormers, although those things are no longer, are kind of being phased out. Um, but you're continuing to use the same dewormer daily. So every day you're giving these parasites the same exposure over and over and over and over and over again. And now by, you know, the 50th day, you haven't killed everything in that, in their intestine. And now those parasites haven't continue to increase their resistance to that specific type. And usually it's going to be an ivermectin base. So when you really have to go and hit them hard with some type of ivermectin to kill a large load, it, ivermectin is no longer going to be available and those parasites are no longer going to be um, sensitive to the ivermectin. So daily dewormers are, are the biggest devil ever. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my screen really fast and I'm going to show you this infographic that we made um, through the LSU Ag Center. And it's just a great like little one shot um, pictorial version of what we like and what we recommend. Okay, so a lot of the information that Dr. Oberhaus went over already, low shedder is less than 200 eggs per gram, moderate is 200 to 500 eggs per gram, high is over 500. Okay, you really kind of want to do your fecal egg counts twice a year, a minimum once a year to kind of determine if your deworming program is working. And once you've figured out that your management and your deworming program is working, you can kind of reduce that just to once a year maybe every other year, depending on if you bring any horses in or change your management program, okay? Um, so the important thing to remember is that 20% of your horses are gonna carry 80% of the parasite load. So not all of your horses are gonna be high shedder. It's gonna be highly unlikely that every single one of your horses is gonna be a high shedder, okay? Um, this will save you money in the long run because you'll only be doing, you'll only be deworming maybe once, twice a year. Um, so you're gonna be decreasing your, your costs. Um, and then the important thing to remember here, especially in the Gulf South, is it gets really hot, right? We all know, we're all, we are all familiar with how humid and how hot our summers get. And so through, there's typically no treatments are needed in the summer months, you know, May through September. I wouldn't say this May because it's been unseasonably cool, but traditionally when it gets over 90 degrees, it's really unlikely that the, um, the, egg, the parasite eggs will develop into larvae. Um, because basically what they, they live, the, the life cycle of a parasite, uh, a worm basically pass through the horse onto the grass. The parasite kind of migrates up to the tip of the blade of the grass in dew drops or in water. Um, and then they'll hatch in the larva and then the horse ingests the larva and it goes through the cycle all over again. Um, when the temperatures are above 80, it's highly unlikely that they'll ever hatch out of the egg stage into the larva stage because they basically get cooked in, um, in the sunlight and in that dew drop, um, they don't really ever get a chance to hatch and, and to live through that process. So we usually don't recommend treating May through September. Um, and here again is just additional measures. We're gonna cross, 
cross graze with ruminants if you have the availability to. You're gonna rotate your pastures. You're gonna mow your pastures to make sure that they're not overtly high, right? Um, and you're gonna over, you're gonna try to minimize overstocking. So you really want, if you're using your pastures to provide all the nutritional needs for your horse, you need to keep in mind that it takes one to two acres per horse to provide all of their nutritional needs from pasture alone. And that's the same thing we wanna think about when we're thinking about parasite load as well. Okay, the most important part I want you guys to, to focus on though is gonna be this actual schedule. And for those of you who follow us on Master Horseman, on the Louisiana Master Horseman page on Facebook, this is the same schedule that Dr. Liz recommends every year. Um, so for low shedders, we're gonna deworm in October and January. For moderate shedders, we're gonna do again, October and January, um, but we're gonna change up the different types of drugs that we're using. And then the high shedders, we're gonna go October, January, and April, okay? And these are just recommended drugs. It, you can change those drugs based upon what you see in your fecal egg count. If you don't wanna do your fecal egg count, it is important to say that most veterinarians will do that for you as well, especially if you have an aversion to poo <laughs> or getting your hands dirty in that aspect. Um, you don't have to do the dirty work if you don't want to. <laughs> Let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I will post a link to this um, infographic on our Facebook page so you guys can find it later if you wanna to refer to it. Stop share, all right. Anybody else have any other thoughts or questions while we're here? Dr. Oberhaus, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? No, I was gonna, let's see, I put the cover slip on the uh, slide. <laughs> Uh, the scientist in me wants to see what's there, so I have to. Um, and actually, I set one up this morning from, I didn't actually, I, I went out into the pasture and I found a few fresh piles and grabbed some, so I don't know which horse they actually came from. But actually, in the first bee collected this morning, I found some roundworms, which was interesting because we have a pretty healthy adult um, herd. We do have some younger pony crosses, so it's possible maybe that it just came from a younger horse, or maybe we have a horse out there that um, has some parasterous. Um, unfortunately, I don't know which horse it was, so I'd have to do all 25 of them to figure out um, who that actually came from. But so when you're visualizing, if you're new to microscopy, um, it, it could be a little daunting. You have the stage here. I don't know. Get a little closer. Um, I always like to tell students to, you know, work on getting yourself focused first and sometimes that, sorry, I know if you want to take a, a microscope slide and put a, a Sharpie X on it, um, or something, you know, something that gives you color that you can clearly identify and then you can, you have a, a coarse focus on the side. I don't know, if you, can you see me? Can you see everything? A coarse focus and a fine focus. And so uh, that slide with an X on it might it help you get acquainted with um, your microscope and how to focus it uh, with both the coarse focus and the fine focus. So when you start to look at your cover slip, first you just want to get everything into focus and you want to do that using the 10x objective. So bring everything and then you can use the fine focus to, um, you have several planes here um, with the, underneath the cover slip and so you want to be able to kind of differentiate between the different planes. But um, if, you, if you're just using a cover slip and you don't have the advantage of the grid system on the McMaster slide, um, then you want to find a methodical way to scan the entire surface of that cover slip and count every parasite egg that you see. So my method is usually to stop to st start excuse me, at one of the top corners and I kind of snake my way from left to right and then back to the left and back to the right working my way down as I go until I've covered the entire surface of the cover slip. Um, if you wanna use something to tally, like a, you know, keep, keep notes next to you. If you wanna purchase a handy dandy clicker that every time you come across an egg, you click and then you don't have to pay attention to both writing and looking. So um, I won't spend too much time because I don't wanna, I know you can't see what I'm looking at, but And there are some trondolites. 
So now I would go through the entire surface of the cover slip, count every strongyle egg that I see, and then um, calculate my eggs per gram of feces, knowing that I used two grams of feces. So that's how to do at-home beagles. Um, again, like Dr. Walker said, veterinary clinics will provide that service to you if, if this is just totally gross to you, but uh, I like to do things myself and learn as I go. And so um, I think it's a valuable tool, especially if you want individual data on your horse um, at any given time. Um, it's a, a great tool that is relatively inexpensive. Um, it just takes your time. And um, so that's really all I had. If you had any other questions or comments. Yeah, I find it important. There are, it is. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go. All right. I was going to say, I do think it is important. Say you bring a new horse home um, and you're going to manage it out in the pasture with your current horses. I do think it's important to do a fecal egg count on that horse once it comes on the property and then fit that horse into your rotational program, right? Everybody has a different way of managing their horses, but new horses coming on, you kind of don't have an idea of how they were managed um, unless you were intimately familiar with that situation. Um, so it's always a good idea to kind of get a baseline on where they're at and then work those horses into your management system as it's appropriate. What were you going to say? I think the important take home message is that you have to account for each horse's individual susceptibility. Um, you can't manage all of your horses the same way um, and you can't, you shouldn't, you know, deworm your horse because your stall neighbor dewormed his. Um, you know, you need to treat your horse, collect the data on your horse, determine your particular horse's need for a specific deworming protocol, and stick with that. So it'll help your wallet in the end, and it'll help with the, um, the parasite or the anthelmintic resistance that, you know, is only set to get worse, with, especially with no new dewormers on the horizon. Um, like Dr. Walker said, I completely agree. We have to continue to work with what we have because there's nothing new being developed, um, or at least nothing new that is on the horizon for horses. Um, so it's important that we, we keep what we have um, effective and, um, and target each individual horse as its own. I will tell you too, um, it's, and I take a fairly lax approach to deworming my horses because all of my horses right now are fat and happy, right? So I don't get bent out of shape if I miss one of those monthly recommendations. If I miss it by a couple of weeks, I'm like, oh, oh okay, let me go hit her real fast. So um, the only time I really start to get worried is if we see a decline in health or you start seeing some of those symptoms of horses that have an, over, an overabundance of parasites. So um, while this definitely is something that needs to be on your mind, it doesn't need to consume you. Um, it's not likely that your horse is going to automatically, you know, call it from parasite load. Um, your horse would start to show you more symptoms before you get to that colic situation. So just keep your eyes on your horse and like Dr. Oberhaus, keep them healthy and do the best that you can with all the tools that you have available. So um, with that, that's all I've got. We didn't have a lot of questions because we didn't have Facebook <laughs> joining us today, but yeah. um, I may have some more questions for you um, once we, we show this video online. Um, for any of you who have specific questions or would like more information about how to make your um, solutions at home, please let us know. We'll be happy to share that information with you um, and kind of a, even a, a shopping list of things that you may need to have to perform these fecals at home. Mm -hmm. um, and you can contact me at nwalker at agcenter.lsu.edu and I'll forward those questions on to Dr. Oberhaus or if I can't answer them. Um, I will be posting that infographic underneath um, this video on Facebook. And if any of you, thank you for joining, of, uh, joining us today through our technical difficulties. Um, we appreciate Sorry, it. Sorry, it was all me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, not all you, because I couldn't get on Facebook either. So um, we appreciate you guys listening. And if you ever need anything, despite this being an equine uh, deworming topic, if it's anything else that you need information on, please don't hesitate to ask. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Bye.